they can see us. Uh, You're live. Okay. Oh. We're on already? All right. So open your Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 6. You remember Matthew 6, of course, is part of the Sermon on the Mount, the Matthew chapter 5, and following up, it continues Jesus' teaching. Uh, he teaches on giving alms, and then about prayer. Of course, that's where we uh, get the instruction to pray after this manner in verse 9 of chapter 6, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name, and so on. How to forgive, as you get down into verse 14. 15, if you don't forgive, uh, mend their trespasses. Some people will say, well, remember that this was pre the cross, so this was still talking to the uh, unregenerate, basically, uh, the Jewish people under the law, which is somewhat true, but if we don't forgive, then you got to ask yourself, if we're bound in unforgiveness, what happens? Uh, and then he talks about in fasting, he talks about laying up treasures uh, for yourself as opposed to laying up treasures in heaven. Uh, you can't add to your stature uh, whatsoever. In verse 27, 29, he talks about Solomon and all of his glory and how he was arrayed. Um, yet it was nothing compared to what the Lord had done. And so he says to us in verse 31, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? He, clothed? he says, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God. And now I know we could all say, because we've been in the Lord for a while, well, we did that. Did you do that? Yes. Okay. But are you still doing that? Because as you know, in so many of the tenses, the aorist tense is us always seeking first the kingdom. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are you still seeking his righteousness all the time? Like a daily, uh, hourly, moment by moment event? Because that's what he's signifying here. Seek first the kingdom. That means make the kingdom top priority. When it talks about uh, seeking, it, the, when you look in the Greek here, the words uh, it means to seek as though you're looking to find, right? Ask, knock, seek or ask, seek, knock, uh, uh, seek as though you're looking to find it and pursue it, attain it, take hold of it, the kingdom, but also his righteousness, which means, remember, his righteousness is not what we think righteousness is, that we did good or we were okay. So, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because what is it? We, if we don't have his righteousness, seek the kingdom all you want, right? You're not going to attain it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All the things that you need all the things you have to have in life, all the things that sustain us, whether it's food, supply, shelter, uh, peace, joy, rest, everything we have need of. He says if we will seek first the kingdom, that means every day a priority of kingdom first. Where does that put you and me in the list? <laughs> Think about it. How many people... That are still, uh, and, and they're professing Jesus. They've maybe met the Lord and have, have walked somewhat with the Lord. But in daily life, all these other things are the attraction now. Uh, so when we say the word first here, seek first the kingdom. In the Greek, it means to place the highest rank 
or the highest influence. So what do we rank the highest in what we do in life? And that's not a passive, you know, just sort of float along in thing. And then what influences us the most? Now, if we say we're seeking his righteousness and his righteousness is really influencing us, means daily and all through the day, we're going to be mindful of what we say, how we come off, how we prayed, what we're believing for, because if we are in his righteousness, we're definitely believing him for what he said he will do and who he is. And so we're blessed in all of that. Uh, so first is how you rank in importance. I mean, isn't there something called uh, top rank boxing? You familiar with that? That means it's the top, right? It's ranked at the top. Uh, hold in high esteem. So when we talk about seeking first the kingdom, means we hold the kingdom things in first esteem. It means we're always mindful of that because that's what we've been called into. And now I know you still, you go to youth events with your children or like now everybody's doing graduations and uh, graduation parties and all that's in there. There's no doubt about that. But is the main priority in all of our lives and what we do and how we proceed in all these things based on the kingdom. And you know church isn't the kingdom, right? Coming to church, that's not the kingdom. This is what we do to attain the kingdom. Uh, we do church, we listen, we're uh, you know, instructed and sometimes maybe reprimanded through what we hear in the word. I don't know if any of you have ever been reprimanded mm -hmm. through what you hear in the word. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good to hear. That means you're alive. So let's go back just to the word seek. Uh, of course, I said to seek like in order to uh, find or take hold of. Uh, and of course, it means continually seek, just like when we do ask, seek, knock. It's continual asking, continual seeking, continual knocking uh, to get the will of the Lord uh, done. So to seek in order to find uh, involves our thought life, what we meditate upon. You know, a lot of people, they walk out of church, their meditation is what we're going to do now uh, as far as it's Sunday and we don't have to go to work and we've got all this stuff we can go do. And sometimes that meditation is going on right in here while we're in church. Can't wait to get out of here. Can't wait till this is over. Uh, we've talked about here many times. Uh, someone has come to the place where they want to meet Jesus and ask Christ to be Lord of their lives. And other people are rushing off to what they have to do. They don't see the value of that. They don't hold in high esteem that somebody has just stepped out of the realms of darkness and into the light of the gospel. They were dead and now they're alive. As the father said to his oldest son, your younger brother, he was dead out there in the world. But now he's alive. He's come back. He's come to his senses. He's realized the error of his ways. And so in all this, having this all the time, and, and I know as we go through troubles and trials and various things in life, we can kind of wane in a lot of this. And I'm not saying you all, I'm saying we all. Just like I said, uh, in fact, maybe I'll throw this in here real quick and come back to this. Sunday I talked about uh, what Paul said, I think it was this Sunday, about whether we or an angel or anybody bring you any other doctrine. Mm -hmm. And I said about the fact that Paul threw we in there, including himself. In other words, if I get into heresy or I get into false doctrine, false teaching, he's basically saying, don't listen to me. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't seen this in the national news down in Myrtle Beach, which is where we just were, uh, a pastor in a church um, in a very populated, expensive area there 
his wife committed suicide. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on in this now. And then they started talking about, and this is, this is people who are in the know down there and sources and so on. In fact, the FBI apparently has been called in to investigate it. But uh, I listened to a lot of the things of the people, what they said and what this is into. And listen, if you ever think I'm having an affair with somebody, you need to come and confront me. And don't play games about it. And I don't mean just me. It should be any of us. Uh, not in an accusatory way, because if we talk to somebody and they say, well, wait, that's my cousin or that's my whatever. I had to deal with them for this, that, or the other. But they have found so many things in here. It's so bizarre at this point. One thing after another after another. And you have to say, where were some of the spiritual people in the church? Or is it just one of those um, transitional churches where these people just come and they go back home and so on. We get a good crowd and whatever. But there's other folks involved that have been there for quite a while. And, and I'm not putting them down, but I'm saying somebody has to say, listen, if you've been doing this and now we know there was some things here, I don't know if you're fit to be in this position. Uh, it's not like you just say, well, I got a position and nobody can ever take me out of it. Mm. And I'm saying all this me in the position I'm in. But when things follow one after another, you got to realize there's something majorly wrong. And I'm not judging the guy, I'm judging the facts of what we're hearing has happened in the past and some of the uh, things they have documented, basically. Um, yeah, so this has turned into a big investigation. It's going to bring a lot of shame on a lot of people there and so on. Of course, you know what? The Bible says that's going to happen. Uh, and the sad thing is, if it didn't happen at certain points in time, I think the church would just go on like everything's la-di-da and we don't have any battles, we don't have any this, that, or the other. Doesn't mean we justify somebody living in sin by any means whatsoever and maybe should have not been allowed to remain in this position based on some of the things that have gone on. But the idea that um, it ain't going to be all roses. And then you have a lot of people that are going to be so hurt by what happened, as I've said so many times, you have a church that splits, and so now that split left, and all those people are there, and then somebody finds out that pastor has done some stuff or is getting into things that they shouldn't have, and all of a sudden there's all these people. Now what do we do? And now somebody in their silliness of mind says, well, God wants more churches, so okay, now you have a church with no leader, people followed a person, most of them never even prayed and said, Lord, do you want me to do this or follow this? They just followed the herd. Mm -hmm. And so there they are, and now they need somebody to keep them going, and so all of a sudden there's all this controversy and herd after herd after herd. And so in all this stuff, man, we need to really be praying. Mm -hmm. And as I've said so many times here lately, and you know I've been praying for the church. Most of the time when I go to prayer meetings, I pray for the church mm -hmm. because the church is what Christ has built. Uh, the church is where he's called us and where he set us free in all this. The church was the Jewish people called out to serve him. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the church was born at Pentecost. I don't know that I agree with that. I think it was revival at Pentecost. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. When you lost something, it meant you had something. Mm -hmm. And it got lost, right? Like the woman with the coins and lost one and swept till she found it and uh, so on. And so you look at all these things and you say, where is our spiritual understanding people are trying to come up with this wisdom stuff which if you do the word that's wisdom god's wisdom is all through this gospel 
You want to know how to win your enemies? Do what the gospel says. You want to win souls? Do what the gospel says. This is all wisdom. Then we talk about what the Bible says. Knowledge puffs up. People get a lot of knowledge, and all of a sudden, they're talking all this stuff. How about demonstrating it? How about living it out? We talk about the power of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming in the upper room. Well, now you've got gifts that you didn't have an operate in before, but now you need maturity to control yourself operating in the gift. Because all of a sudden you think because you got a gift, now you can do anything or live any way you want to. You're watching some of these older guys uh, saying that, you know, I made a lot of mistakes and, you know, I maybe should have never done this or should have never done that. Isn't that nice to say after you've taken millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in and now you can just sort of coast? It's like I said to somebody that got a very, very large donation. I said, well, now that you've gotten all that donation money, are you going to go and give back to some of the groups that helped you along the way? Uh-uh. Not at all. Ah. Anyway, you want to know about being troubled about things and how many other places this kind of stuff has gone on. And you don't want to bring reproach on the body of Christ or shame on the gospel or, you know, you don't want to embarrass Jesus or hurt God in any way or grieve the Holy Spirit in any of these type of things. If you're seeking the kingdom first, it means you're mindful of that all the time and how we come off in things. So back to Matthew chapter six there what you think on, what you reason like, how you reason things out. Reason. Or what's the reason I did that? Or what's the reason I responded that way? Or what's the reason I won't? And you go through all the, that's reasoning. How you reason things out in your mind. Is it always with the kingdom first? Or is it me first? And we can all do that, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to seek after, seek first the kingdom, seek first his righteousness, seek after the kingdom of God, keep going to it. Now, if you and I think we're already in it, if Abraham, <clears throat> Abram, when he started, thought he was already in the promised land, what would he have done? He pulled out his fishing pole, went to the lake, sat down, said, I'm here, I've arrived. And so many people think they've arrived. Forget that we're working out our salvation, right? We're saved, we're being saved, and we'll be saved if we continue to the end, if we hold fast those things that we've been given. So it's to uh, inquire into, continue inquiring. That means not saying, well, I'm saved, so I don't have to learn anymore. And how many folks, we just again showed the video there with some of these fellows about the uh, once saved, always saved doctrine, which means I don't have to go to church anymore if I don't want to. I don't need to pray. Why bother? I'm going to heaven anyway. I don't need to repent because I'm going to heaven anyway. Uh, I don't need to do any church or this stuff or that stuff. I don't need to give. I don't need to forgive because I said Jesus and I'm going to heaven. What in that gives you any gumption to do any more of the gospel or to serve the Lord or to work out your own salvation or to press toward the mark, why bother? We're going to heaven. We all, y'all just sit here for the rest of your life in the pew. <laughs> Don't go home. <laughs> you get to heaven sooner because you won't eat. And why, what's, what's the difference? 
What does it matter? I don't know how you can justify all that. I, don't, I can't get it in my Bible. I don't know. I don't see it anywhere. I see where men fell from grace. I see where men were separated from. The, did I just talk about Saul and Andorra? I did? That's what I thought. And I just heard somebody do a message on it. And you know what? You think about, oh, yeah, because I said, when you're not getting your prayers answered, don't turn to other things, right? Like you're going to, let's say you got a, of course, we're a little older, but you got a, a guy you want or a girl you want. So you, you're going to force that instead of like, Lord, what, what do you say? So you keep pushing it and pushing it to where you become almost demanding, which now puts you in the realm of you're almost into a, a control freak mode. And you're saying, well, this is the Lord answering my prayers. No, it ain't. <laughs> when you see these guys that uh, do these big ministry things, if they start getting into milking people in a sense, that ain't God blessing them. They'll get away with it maybe for a while, but in the end, what's the Bible say? We're all going to answer, mm -hmm. right? Every man is going to answer. To seek is to in part require in other words i i require the kingdom i require righteousness and then it's like as you're craving something so if we talk about what we crave the most what is it fuel a land one day i'll stand is it that, or is it, you know, a lot of the things of the world out here? A lot of societal things. The younger folks, I guess a lot of us, we're sort of taken care of here for a while until we get to the end, but they're striving for this and striving for that. Are they passing up the blessings of God? I guess I could say to you young folks out there listening, if you're out there, are you striving so much to get somewhere that you're missing everything of God? Are you seeking his righteousness? Or are you seeking the new business mode, the new sales pitch, uh, the new product that's going to get you more money and get you more connections and everything else? All of this stuff. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all these things. In other words, you work on righteousness, God will work on blessing you. And if it isn't blessings like that, you'll be blessed with peace, right standing with God, knowing you have salvation, walking with the Lord. All of this craving, uh, when you say, his righteousness, we're basically saying to God, God, I want your righteousness in my life. I want you working in me as you said you would. And I know you want this vessel to be clean. I know you can use unclean vessels. You can use a donkey. You can use a, a rock uh, to spew out the water. You can use Moses in rebellion and still meet the needs of the people, all those type of things. But I want to be clean. I want to be a fit vessel, a vessel of honor, as the Bible talks about in the house, vessels of honor and dishonor. I want to be a vessel of honor in whatever I'm uh, asked to do here. So to crave or demand something, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I don't know if we just started taking more time to seek the Lord and his righteousness in the sense of, Lord, my mindset, my thoughts, uh, what I meditate on, where I go, what aggravates me, what in, ensnares me, uh, what draws me in. I don't know Do you all, even though we're getting a little bit older here, that you feel things are still trying to draw you in, uh, like the mind, think about this, worry about that. Because what's he say here? Uh, All these things shall be added unto you. In verse 34, he says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. What does that mean? 
don't worry, don't think about it. Does it mean don't think about it? It means don't worry, because what is worry? Worry is a sin. The actual definition of worry, I, th I went and looked it up, just to anxiety and uneasiness about the future that is rooted, this is a biblical definition, rooted in a lack of trust in God and his purpose. The Bible also says that worry is a waste of time mm -hmm. and energy because it doesn't help solve any problems. How about no thought? Let's take a look at that for a minute. Now, who would like to hear that? Don't think about tomorrow. Socialism, communism, Marx, Lenin. Uh, I just got the thing there. I know it's in there, too. Uh, I was reading some articles, but in, uh, uh, what's that thing called? Um, they send, a, send us a thing every so often. But it's on the deconstructionism, deconstruction of your faith and of religion and so on and how they've worked to, uh, you know, there are multiple websites you can go on or YouTube videos and channels. You can go watch them just bash everything we do and how unvaluable and unnecessary and how wrong we are uh, that there is no God. And this was all part of Marx and Lenin and them and the, the plan and program they wanted to put in to get a society with no religion, which means gospel-oriented religion, not just denominational things, because they'll let those go on. They'll fall right in line. A lot of the church areas of religion will follow right in line with what they want to do. Um, <clears throat> so take no thought, does it mean don't think about what can happen down the road. I see your eyebrows going up and your forehead's wrinkling some. So what if Joseph said, well, I'm not going to take any thought for tomorrow. I'm going to own nothing and be happy. Because that's what they want. Where would have his family and Egypt and everybody else been. So it doesn't mean take no thought because Joseph thought seven years ahead, right? Um, well, even Abraham, when we look at Abraham, he had to think ahead because he had to keep going to get to where God wanted him to, right? So when you talk about our salvation, is our salvation something we take no thought of? That's the scary part of what I was talking about earlier. People who think that that's the doctrine that don't have to do anything, they don't have to think about anything because they don't see any future. But all of us who see a future in the kingdom, we have to take thought every day about what's in front of us. And some of these things where down the road, what is this going to manifest? You know, it's like when you planted bulbs in your front yard, flower bulbs, and you put it in there. You took thought for down the road. One day, it's going to be a flower. I don't know if you saw these things. They're called scotch brooms out there in the front. Uh, all the flowers that popped out. Everything is overloaded right now uh, because of all the rain, and then we got those hot days and so on. Uh, but you think about in all of this stuff, a farmer plants a crop thinking about down the road, I'm going to have to go out and harvest it all and cultivate it in between and watch for vermin and watch for fungus and uh, if you have a lot of water, that type of stuff and uh, all that stuff. So he's not saying don't think ahead or plan ahead. He's saying that not to worry about it because he says there's enough evil Take no thought for tomorrow, for uh, the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so the evil, of course, have any of you been tempted with anything lately? 
Oh, I just wondered. I haven't, so I want to know. You can tell me what you've been tempted with. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, uh, at the high school, I talked to the young people, and I said, listen, I want to talk to you about, in Corinthians there, where it says, there is no temptation that is not common to man, and God will make a way out, and so on. And she, yeah, I think it's in 10, Corinthians 10. Anyway, I want you to understand that you're going to have temptations that are going to come on you that are going to be strong. But according to what God said, which we've talked about here, he's already taken the ones that are too hard. He's already dealt with them for you. He's taken care of that. He said so. He won't let anything come to you that you can't endure. So think about his love. Uh, and so I said, you're going to have thoughts of things. And some of you may be already. And then one of them said, well, let's talk about what we're thinking, which I, I didn't really want to go there uh, and have them talk about stuff. But that's what they did. Uh, and so then we just sort of dealt with all those as they went along and so on, areas they've been tempted and how they felt it sometimes like I couldn't overcome this. And, uh, you know, have you ever felt like you couldn't overcome something? We've all gone through that. And that's why I said to them again, now listen, if I could tell you that I can remember a day where I wasn't tempted of something, I, I'd probably have it written down in a notebook because it would be a day like no other. Uh, there's always something. This guy cut me off in traffic. These people are rude to me at the cash register. Or, are you crazy, girl? You don't know how to do... I mean, you go through something everywhere you go. Um, anyway, so just talking about those things. So there's enough temptation in today not to worry about tomorrow. Now, taking no thought for tomorrow to a lot of people means... Well, I don't need to know anything about the future, you know, Antichrist, the signs, the, you know, the horsemen. I, I don't need to know any of that. Or, uh, Really? You should be able to pay attention to be able to say, if we're watchmen for other people and warning other people, we should know so we can tell them. And people say to me, and I tell you this all the time, well, don't get discouraged. Uh, well, don't be fearful. I'm not fearful and I'm not discouraged. I know this is what the Bible said is going to come and you need to know it because it, you're living like it, it, it ain't happening. You're going to own nothing spiritually and be happy. Well, it tells me you're not warning anybody. And then again, what are we in all this? What did God bring us in this for? Remember, we didn't choose him, he chose us. He chose us for a reason, right? Yes. And a lot of that reason may be the people we're around or will influence or will see us or hear us or move in our neighborhood or we'll move in theirs or work around us or any of those type of things. Does that make you think about, you know, why would God choose me? And if it's not the Lord, how could I influence anybody? So righteousness in a broad sense is the state of him who as he is as he ought to be. Righteous, holy, just, truthful, honest in all of his sayings, able to bring about what he says. Uh, righteousness is the condition of being acceptable to God. Justified is making us acceptable, which means righteousness can now dwell in us. Where righteousness couldn't dwell in us before, it would be like the parable about the, uh, the wine skin and the new wine. Righteousness couldn't dwell in us because we were all old, beat up, ready to burst any good thing put in us would have destroyed us. And the Lord made us a new wineskin uh, to hold what he's given us. So Joseph took thought, planned for seven years ahead. How many of you know the scripture in Proverbs 13, 22? Somebody quote it for me real quick. <laughs> You're in this place. A good man, can insert woman, leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. 
That's your grandkids, right? Children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaves an inheritance. What is he doing? He's taking thought for tomorrow and for their tomorrow, not only his own, in all these things. That's Proverbs 13, 22. I had a talk with one of the singers that was here a long time ago uh, talking about family situations and things, and he was saying how that wasn't his family's attitude, although it should have been, and so at the end it was just bankrupt and how it hurt everybody. So take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for after all these things do the Gentiles seek and while you're in church or in service of the Lord in ministry and various things of the church how many times you see a lot of other folks they're just out there with all this stuff and they got no thought of that whatsoever um, or meeting the needs of people or anything else. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And you know, when you know that you didn't work for something, like you didn't work for salvation, Jesus did, but yet you're given something because you just were, let's say, you were the Mary at Jesus' feet, knowing the eternal and the good things that were the more necessary and being rewarded for it, that you were serving the Lord. And that's where I say in a lot of this, Church has turned into basically like a business type thing. We have these people on staff and those people on staff. And then you wonder, would those people do what they do in any part if they weren't on staff and getting paid and benefits and the whole thing and whatever goes with that? You wonder if folks would still do what they do. Is it ministry? Is it under the Lord? Or is it? Well, I get to do it to the, for the Lord while I get all this. And in all that, you know, we can get kind of confused. Uh, you can tell people when suddenly that it's all about money. I mean, they're excited about money. They're depressed when it's about money. And, you know, I know we go through some rough times in life. Many of us have. And uh, some of them are embarrassing in a sense. But to keep your head up and be right and honest in the Lord and continue to believe him and not lose sight of uh, faith, keeping the faith and being uh, righteous and continuing in the kingdom, all these things uh, that he's called us to do here. So the doctrine concerning the way in which a man may attain a state approved of God Integrity, virtue, purity of life, this is all righteous, righteousness. Correctness of thinking, acting, and also just justice or virtue, which gives each his due. You know, God is righteous, right? That's why he says, in the end, every man will get according to what he's done. And so even in that, if you think about the socialism and uh, communism and so on, and you know, you'll know you own nothing and be happy, well, God is the one who allowed us to work to get a wage. Parable in the Bible, those men that stood idle in the street, they were given a wage. Every man was given a certain amount according to what was agreed upon. And then at the end, he received what the agreement was. And that's how we're supposed to live, how we should treat other people, how we should expect uh, to be rewarded for what we do in those areas. Uh, it's all what the Lord has intended and put in place. And that's why there's such a warfare against all this. 
uh, talking to these young folks, we talked about some spiritual things. And I kept saying, you guys, I want you to understand, everybody you're around, there is a spirit that's involved. Uh, one of them was talking about a certain place they were, and a person did something like a uh, cursing type thing. And I said, so there you are, there's a spirit working in that person. And they're against the spirit that's in you. You've heard me say many times when the Bible talks about Israel, it talks about God put a difference between them, the outsiders, and you. He's put a difference between the true believer in Jesus and them out there. It says in the scripture, they're of another spirit. We're of the spirit of God. And so the fruit of the spirit should be working in us. Otherwise, we got to question whether we're really in the Lord in all these things. So seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I just want to keep encouraging us no matter what we're going through in all these things and what goes on around us. Again, you think about how excited everybody was for the eclipse and how they got together, how they took off work. I think we probably know people that never took off work to be in church. You think about all that type of stuff, but the eclipse, party, Super Bowl, whatever, we'll do all that. And then you think like, how important is all of this uh, that we do in the Lord? And I know with the younger areas here of people and so on, this, things are a little bit different, but it would sure be good to see some younger people who say, we want it the way it was according to what Jesus did, the disciples did. Remember, that's what we grew up trying to do. Like Paul said, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ and so on. Follow me as I follow the Lord. Uh, not trying to make it like, well, it's got to be this for me to be there. And I got to have that for me to like it. And as you, if you're singing that song, well, I'm not going to open my mouth and I'm not going to raise my hands because that's not one of our songs. And that's gone on in plenty of things. So... Uh, that's why I kind of rejoiced when I first came to the Lord. I used to go to that little place where the pastor ministered a few times, and he was telling us to go to church on Sunday mornings because we were just a Saturday night prayer meeting. And they sang those old hymns and everything else, but it was clean. I don't know, did you feel clean Saturday night when we had those fellows over there at Jericho? It was just good, yeah. clean gospel music some awesome voices mm -hmm. but who said one of you ladies i won't even say who but said to me i can't tell which voice is coming out of which person <laughs> and then they did what they did did you think he would be the tenor or the what's the other baritone or alto or some kind of thing like that anyway amen so father we thank you for this night and lord i pray for each one of us father to be seeking the kingdom and seeking your righteousness. And I guess if we get your righteousness, we'll get the kingdom. So, Father, I pray that for all of us tonight in our thinking, what we meditate upon, what we speak out. Uh, Father, what we do, what we abstain from, what we draw near to, Lord, in all these things. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus because not one of us would make it without that blood. Amen. Father, not one of us would make it without the power of the Holy Ghost. As is coming this Sunday, people will be doing Pentecost messages and everything else. Lord, the power of that gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to purge all that that was within us. And Father, I thank you that you're a God who answers by fire. Amen. You answered Amen. your people that night. You revived Israel, uh, the third day, the resurrection, all of that coming into culmination, and then you baptized them with the Holy Ghost Amen. and power. 
And Father, power to overcome sin, power to live in righteousness. Father, it didn't come of them. It's not of us. It's what you've given us. Amen. So we thank you tonight. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Just pray your blessing in all who hear and receive. In Jesus' name, amen.